We're going live. Yes, I think. I don't know the answer. Okay, to so we're live here with yeah. Rachel, you're on mute, so I don't know what I'm saying. You have to probably keep yours unmuted, John. Okay, okay. I think we're live. So we're live here doing a fireside chat. As I pointed out, we're using candles. It's my house, 710 South 4th Street. It's a 116 year old house, it's gonna be 117 in a couple days until <laughs> we turn the corner. And uh, sit here with a hot cup of cocoa. It's a beautiful winter night, and I'm here to take questions. This is something we want to do more regularly, and we're going to actually have a lot more policy-based um, conversations with subject matter experts. But tonight is get to know uh, John Lash, why I'm running, and also a Q&A, so people have several platforms. Uh, I've got several cell phones set up. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we're on uh, Zoom, and probably Instagram. So I may have missed something, but this is several platforms where we're, we're trying to bring a bunch of uh, questions and it's gonna be complicated. It might be a couple technical problems. I'm sure we'll work through it and perfect it in 2021. <laughs> so let's start off. Who's got questions? How are these coming at me? And, and who's gonna narrate and how do we want uh, questions to come in? So if somebody has a question on Zoom, uh, what should they just ask it uh, if they have a question? Yeah, to I'll, I'll add in there. So if you're on Instagram or Facebook, uh, myself, I'll be reading those. Uh, Andrew will be reading them off of Twitter and possibly Facebook. And then Kate will be handling the Zoom calls. So if you um, are on line on one of the social media platforms please go ahead and just write in the chat in the live chat and as we see them we will uh, be asking john those if you're on the zoom call please um just raise your hand and kate will um unmute you when there's a chance for her to jump in and we'll be keeping an eye on that as well i do have a first question that had come in before we got started i got a couple of them here so um this is eve she is asking new year's is right around the corner what are your hopes for 2021? Okay, 2020 has been a disaster. I think everybody between the pandemic and uh, the economic crisis that's unfolded has left a lot of people feeling disconnected, feeling like they can't trust their government, trust the news sources, and just clinging on to something better. Also, I personally lost some friends. I've, I had a lot of friends who've got COVID um, and, and lost time from work, lost their jobs. And going door to door, you hear a lot of sad stories. So I think the number one thing that I'm excited about for 2021 is to see a vaccine and see some return, a, a bounce back better than what we had for normal. I'm hopeful uh, that with a, a new president, we can end some of the uh, chaos and and misdirection, misinformation, and I'm hopeful that uh, we can win this election. I'm very excited about the opportunities that we have for our city. I've said that this is a campaign where the, the city of lights, Aurora, the city of lights can be a beacon of hope. I think people are looking for something better, and I think that we can present a democratic, people-powered government that works for everybody with an economy that strives to work for everybody. It won't happen overnight, but over the course of time, we're going to get there, and it's going to be very exciting. Okay, I've got another question from Lily, who says, "What's the one thing you miss now with COVID?" <laughs> the one, the one thing I miss with COVID. Uh, people can jump in the chat and say what they miss most. Uh, I, I got a haircut because we were doing this fireside chat today, and I told the the barber that the the worst part of COVID, the first shutdown, was was not having a haircut. <laughs> So, I don't know if that's the, the best answer is probably going to be some better ones in the chat, but not having, getting access to just a haircut, it drove me nuts. And uh, Jordan from the, um, uh, from Facebook asks, what's your first priority if, when you get elected? I think the first thing we're going to have to do is establish trust with the, with the public and to include the public uh, in the discussions that are happening at City Hall and set out an agenda for the city. So I'm running for mayor. I have 
a very clear vision of where I want to take the city, but I also believe firmly in democracy and that our job in the council chambers is to represent everybody. Um, even if I don't agree with their opinions, those opinions need to be heard and at the table. So the first priority to reestablishing trust is I've said that I'll take a 25% pay cut. It's, it's not because the mayor's overpaid or anything, but it's to send a message that this is a job of public service. We have a full-time city manager. I will have a full-time city manager. I will do away with the title deputy mayor. I don't think that an unelected person should have the title of, of mayor anything. So I will have a chief of staff um, or city manager. Um, but but sent, taking that pay cut, I want to push for some ethics reforms and some caps on spending so those people that are doing business through a city hall are capped at the, the amount of money that they can contribute to political campaigns and reduce the amount of influence over city hall. And that means that that governing body, that the council chambers belong to the people and that we won't just serve the wealthy people who can buy access. Uh, so these are just a few of it. I've said that we need to have within the first 30 to 60 days, large scale community meeting, a goal setting meeting that involves several uh, key constituencies. One is the general public, those people who show up, whether it's in person or on Zoom, uh, staff, and elected officials, not only the council, but inviting our state reps, our county board members, our township trustees, school board members. So we all have a seat at the table as we adopt this shared goal and agenda, it's ours. We own it. Everybody can always point back to the goals that we establish in, in those first 60 days. Okay, we're gonna head over to Kate. If you wanted to go ahead and unmute and introduce the next question or the next person who's gonna ask the question. Okay, um, we'll wait two questions. I think we lost Dr. G, so uh, maybe we'll wait until he gets back. Um, Casey, I'm going to unmute you so you can go ahead and ask your question. Or you have to unmute you. Did somebody put a question in chat? I can see the chat. Um, yeah, yeah, I put it in chat. Uh, what specifically would you do different? from the current administration to be more transparent and inclusive? Okay, good question. I think So I hope I, I laid out kind of the, the democratic process, which I think somewhat answers the inclusive conversation um, and, and, and trying to include those voices of even of, of dissent and people that disagree with me. Um, so I think that at least they feel like their voice was heard if the council votes um, one majority against them, that they at least feel like they had a, a chance to bring the discussion forward to the council. Um, transparency. So, uh, publishing meetings that I have, I think that's one thing that we can do. Um, I want to have more discussion within the, the council chambers, the committee of the whole. If anybody's watched our current city council meeting, it's almost like they're in a hurry to get out of there. There's this massive consent agenda, and rarely do items get pulled out of consent. And then you think, well, maybe they had a, a worthwhile discussion. And some committees do have worthwhile discussions, but the, at the committee of the whole, I don't see worthwhile discussions. There's always a motion just to put everything in consent, and then they get to the, the actual council meeting and they all vote yes um, for, for this massive consent that, that includes a lot of um, information. So that's actually, Maybe it's not transparency as much as more democracy. Um, and, and I'm open to other ideas that people have for us to have a, a more transparent government, a more transparent way of spending money. You know, uh, we, Judd Lofshi and I were recently answering questions about the budgeting process. And, you know, he said they had seven meetings, several public meetings. But the public, it wasn't a dialogue. There was no dialogue with the public saying where their priorities were. So I think that's a... Again, it's more democratic, giving the, the public a voice and a chance to have a dialogue with the council about uh, budget matters. Does that answer your question? Kate, do you want to read um, yes. Dr. G's? Okay. He asks, what is the fiscal situation with the city? I imagine COVID has us running a deficit. 
So I think the city's budget has a lot of people concerned. And if we continue and keep the same mayor, we're going to be further in debt uh, without a plan to get out of that, that debt. So we're, we're about a billion dollars in debt and we're paying high interest rates on that debt. So uh, some of the things that we need to do to address it, because this affects taxpayers, right? The more in debt we go, the higher people's property taxes go. And sometimes when I knock on doors, they'll ask about property taxes, but these are all connected. So, right, I'm looking over here and looking over here. <laughs> it's a little bit complicated with all the cameras in here. But there's, there's several things. Um, one is there, the current council has been spending millions of dollars subsidizing private entities. So they spent over $10 million of the taxpayers' money to buy a property with intent of moving the casino out to the Farnsworth Interchange out by the, the Outlet Mall. Um, if the casino wants to move and buy property and redevelop that property, I have no problem with that. I do have a problem with the taxpayers being on the hook for that $10 million. There's discussion of it might go up to $50 million to subsidize the move of the casino. This is fiscal irresponsibility. There's no reason the taxpayers should be on the hook for this. As I've knocked on doors, not one person, when I, when I ask them, you know, what do you want to see done better in City Hall? Nobody goes, you know, I really think we ought to move the casino out to the outlet mall. Nobody's ever said that. So why are the taxpayers then being shoveled into debt to do that? And then also prevents us from investing that money into our community and creating more economic opportunities. Secondly, there's been an abuse and overuse of TIFs. TIF districts, for those who are not familiar with them, um, allow uh, a business to go in and avoid paying taxes for up to 23 years. I think the, the current situation with the casino, they have a 23 year tax abatement. They don't have to pay taxes. So what that does is it affects, say, the school district. When I was on the school board, our budget was short a million dollars per year when I first took office in 2015. And so what we had to do, the taxpayers still have to pay the teachers. They still have to heat the buildings. They still have to buy books. So they still have a budget to build. Well, that just increases everybody's property tax. So a TIF is nothing more than a, a, a property tax increase. Um, and in some blighted areas, there might be use for a TIF but it's just been way overused in this administration. So those are some ways that we can reduce the budget. Um, I'm very frugal. I, I think while we we're talking about it, a lot of my stuff comes up from the thrift shop. I'm big into reusing, recycling, um, very much an environmentalist. I uh, would run the city with that same frugal way of, of, that I run my own life. Um, and anyway, that uh, addresses a little bit of the, the city's Deficit, um, of course, we need to continue to try and bring new resources into the city. This is a big part of why we're running, and we're, what, 15 minutes in, and I haven't even talked about green building and all the, the money out there for energy efficiency and for solar panels. And if we had a Department of Sustainability that would help homeowners and business owners attract uh, some of those economic incentives that are already out there, it would bring a lot of money to our local economy, create better paying jobs, uh, it would help homeowners save money on their heating and cooling bills. And hopefully we can put people that have been affected by the pandemic, people that have slipped through the cracks in our education system and not graduated from high school, um, people who struggled through by learning English as a second language and might be behind on the education curve and in their, their 20s might be looking for a better economic opportunity because they weren't you know, able to go to college, and people who are re-entering society from uh, having served time in prison. Let's give all those people a, a chance at a good paying job. And this is what um, I'm looking at doing to address poverty and to attract money. So there's a benefit to our, the homeowners and business owners that choose to invest in those programs and bring that money into our local economy. And there's also uh, opportunities for people who might be working low wage jobs. So that's a way to better our local economy, um, address the budget deficit, um, is to stop with some of the reckless spending and corporate bailouts and to better invest our money into, into the community. Okay, I've got a fun question off of Instagram here. <laughs> Who is the most fascinating person you've met? Most fascinating person I've met, uh, James Tinwa, is an organizer with Jobs with Justice. He 
organized the occupation of Republic windows when uh, banks were getting bailed out. One of the banks that, that subsidized uh, Republic windows, the Republic took a, a big chunk of money from them, and then they uh, locked the workers out, just told them they weren't going to pay them for their last two weeks of work. And so James Tinwa organized an occupation of that Republic Windows factory and was a historic moment during the, the Occupy movement and the, the effort to uh, push back. Um, and I, I met him and had some deep dialogue with him, just a, a very revolutionary mind, um, very iconic figure. He's, he's passed away. He died from cancer, but definitely one of the... Um, coolest dudes I've ever met. Fantastic. Um, Gregory on Facebook asked, what is your view on the power of a major, or uh, sorry, on a mayor to play an influential role in state and national level policy through visionary local policies? Okay, so I, I just kind of going to restate that question. How can a mayor play into state and national policies. Is that, is that a good summary of that question? So how can a mayor play into uh, state and national policies? Okay, right, so uh, I got three answers that come to mind quickly. Uh, I've said it time and again, I want Aurora to be city of lights, beacon of hope. I think we can do things differently where government works for everybody. Uh, where we're very focused on a 21st century vision to, to make us a green city. And I think that if we can make a template here that others can follow, they're going to do it. Uh, so that's one way we can influence what happened in, in other municipalities, models for state and federal government to follow. Um, another thing is that I'm not afraid to lobby outside of, of, of the bounds. Sometimes you hear in, in government that you need to stay in your lane, and that means you know, only working um, with with uh, the municipality that you serve and, and not necessarily leaning on other boards. But I, you know, I think that you need to lobby for those things that benefit the residents in, in, of Aurora. I will be lobbying both the state and the federal governments for more funding for green building and energy efficiency. Um, I'm gonna be lobbying for infrastructure. Um, I'm gonna be lobbying for money for more bike trails and parks and things that expand green spaces. I'm going to be lobbying for resources for um, community gardens, for a local food economy, and some of the really exciting things that I've talked to residents that residents are very interested in here in, in Aurora. Um, and if there are policies, I say this too, when they had a, a Muslim ban, uh, when, when uh, the Trump administration took over and had, and had a Muslim ban, there were a few elected officials along with a lot of community leaders that went up to the O'Hare airport and took a stand and said that uh, this was not okay. And I will be one of those people that if on a job I hear racial slurs um, or, or I see discrimination, I'm gonna step up, I'm gonna say something about it. And I'll, I'll do the same thing from the uh, city, city hall chambers. So that's everywhere, that's not just state or local. Um, I think that, that all elected leaders, as, as do all citizens, have a responsibility to step up and say something. Time for a drink of cocoa. <laughs> I, Helen's still connecting here. I think she's going to have a question, but in the meantime, why don't you, yeah, that one. <laughs> yeah, um, Sherry um, sent us a question beforehand. Uh, what do you think about the Aurora Housing Authority as a whole? I think I'm going to expand this question a little bit and talk a little bit about both, both homelessness, low income, affordable housing. Um, the Aurora Housing Authority is largely funded by the federal government and run by the federal government, which means that the, the local, the city has little influence outside of permitting. Um, the, the mayor should have an excellent relationship with the executive director of the Aurora Housing Authority. I would, I would pursue to do that. Um, I would want to see us work in a creative way. I have to mute. Kate, can you mute Helen? Kate, can you mute Helen? There. So back to the Aurora Housing Authority. We had a little technical glitch there. But 
Um, I want to talk just a little bit about affordable housing and, and homelessness. We saw, because of the pandemic, our homeless shelter, Essen House here in Aurora, had to kick everybody out so people didn't get COVID. And then our homeless people had nowhere to go. Uh, one of the things we could do that a lot of municipalities are doing is we could have tiny home solutions. So I'd like to work with Hesed House to create a little tiny home community for homeless people. And then secondly, during the 2008-2009 economic housing crash, a lot of families lost their homes. And so they were put into this big room. So these are families with two or three kids into this big room with a bunch of largely homeless men, some with drug addiction and uh, alcohol addiction. It wasn't really a safe space, and if we had a, a, a tiny home solution, I think that would be better if, if we ever go through that kind of economic collapse again. And the third component of, of both affordable housing, um, the housing authority, or working with Hesed House, I'd like to see is some sort of um, rent-to-own thing. I think there's just more pride in ownership. And what we want is, is a city where more people own their homes, take pride in their homes, take care of their homes, and I think there's just more to that and, and dignity in life that comes from that uh, arrangement versus being a renter or being somebody who is dependent on, um, on, on the Aurora Housing Authority and, and subsidized housing. So it's not going to happen overnight. Um, in, in, you know, getting better living pay, paying wage jobs is a way for us to move in that direction. I've got a follow up question. Um, what's expensive but is totally worth buying? What I'm trying to think of is uh, what's expensive and totally worth buying. On, on my to-do list, <laughs> I would definitely like to buy an electric vehicle uh, to reduce my carbon footprint. I currently drive a Prius. It gets 48 to 50 miles per gallon, which is better than what I had before. But a, a Tesla would, would reduce my carbon footprint significantly be worth it. At the city level, I do want to see us invest in, in uh, publicly owned vehicles, um, so city vehicles, police vehicles being electric, and I think that's a way we can reduce our carbon footprint. Um, it's not going to happen overnight. We're not going to throw all the good cars out and, and uh, buy a bunch of expensive electric cars, but as a car reaches the end of its life cycle in the fleet, uh, we'll phase it out and improve it with um, electric vehicles. And we're going to have to build the infrastructure for that uh, too. So there'll be more charging stations at our uh, public facilities as well as around, around town. Um, so Vincent asks, what is the last book you read and what is your favorite Christmas movie? <laughs> uh, I think everybody likes the Christmas story. <laughs> I think it's, um, I connect to it a lot and it's very funny in this house, there's a uh, little balls at the top of the Newell Post and they come off so it's very reminiscent of the Christmas story. I should get some glue and put it in there so they stay. And what was the other part of that question? The last book you read. The last book I read was The Green New Deal. <laughs> it was a, uh, not that the Green New Deal, but there was actually a follow-up um, working paper about how it would be implemented. It was, it was that thick. It was a Policy proposal, not really a book. I'm not sure if that's a fair question, but I'm not done with it yet. So I, I have two or three pages at the end. So it, it to me, it's a book. Um, John is asking, what role does public transit play in your vision for a green Aurora? Great program, by the way. Thanks for being available. Okay. Thanks for joining us. Thanks everybody for joining us. So the, um, I want to see us be, we, a lot of people, when I um, talk to voters, complain about these big buses driving around the city, and of course I'm thinking emitting emissions, and uh, nobody riding around on them. So I, what I would like to see us do, and, and so the pace is not uh, just the city of Aurora, um, it's an intergovernmental agreement here with the Kane County Board, and receives funding from several directions. But what I would like to see us do is, is make that a smaller, more flexible fleet um, that addresses several transportation needs. Um, it could work to address transportation needs for homeless people going to school. 
uh, for disabled people and um, for low-income people trying to get to and from work. So uh, I think that the routes are currently pretty well planned, but we could make that a smaller fleet, make it electric or, um, or, or, or hybrid or CNG at the, at the minimum. Uh, something that reduces carbon footprint, but it's smaller, more flexible, adaptable, and hopefully cheaper. I'm not sure if that answers your question. You might have another, I, I don't know who that was again, but you might have another great idea. If you have a great idea, throw it in the chat, I'll check it out later. But that, those are some broad strokes about, about where I'd like to go. Um, and Sherry from Facebook asks, as mayor, what would you do different with the police chief and the officers who are known to be corrupt? Um, so I want to be clear that I've heard since I've run for mayor, this is one of the things I did not anticipate was a lot of the stories that I've heard from residents who have been in the, we hear one side of the story mistreated by our police force. I think that um, the police chief who I've met is, it looks, appears to be, I haven't asked her this question, but it appears that she's looking uh, to move on. So I want to answer how would I replace the police chief as just part of this question, even though it wasn't asked. Um, but I think we need to raise, a big part of this, uh, of my administration, and again it won't happen overnight, is changing the relationship between police and the community. And I think that starts with what, what do residents want to see um, from our public service officers. I'd like to see them renamed as community service officers, so this a concept of police is not there, uh, that they are there to serve the public. Um, I do think that we need to have um, a response team capable of responding to something like Henry Pratt, should we go through that again. And I think we need people that are there who are capable of responding to domestic violence. Uh, so there's somebody that's capable of responding to those things in our community. Um, I want to see us be better about having more programs available for youth. So when the police run into a youth, they can say, look, man, you're on the wrong path. And um, there's a program after school that you can go to over here. And they have a place to plug troubled kids into. Um, if it's a young adult and they're out of school, they have a, play, a job training program to plug kids into. So um, I think that our police officers, the ones I've talked to at Doors, want to see something like that. And I think that's how we begin to change the relationship and rebuild trust. I, you know, I'm going to say this also, there's um, people that have alleged racial, um, racially charged police behavior, and, and I think that there needs to be zero tolerance for that um, of, of all city employees. Um, so, you know, I, I understand the concepts of progressive discipline, but I just think we're living through an era where we, we need to get a little more serious about this. So I'm sure that there's some, some better answers out there, um, but, you know, giving the community a bigger say in, in what they want to see in our police force, I'm an advocate for residency, not for so if you currently serve on uh, the Aurora Police Department, you live in Oswego, but you have a job here, you know, I don't think you should uproot your family to move into Aurora, but I do think that new hires could, new, new hires could, um, or should be uh, residents of Aurora. So those are just a, a few things, and again, if you have uh, ideas, put them in. Um, Kate's got one, I think, Helen's, uh, Casey's got one on Zoom, and, and Helen's, I got, I think, on Zoom as well. So, Kate, we're going to turn over to you to introduce the next live question. Uh, yeah, Casey has a question, so Casey, you want to go ahead and ask it? Sure. Um, what would you do different for the current administration to prevent another episode of the downtown riots and looting? Given that there's, there are many disenfranchised minority groups who feel there is more talk than action. So, good question. I think, um, you know, what I've said is I, I believe in engaging those people who disagree with me. I would be foolish to think that I would go through four years without having some issue come before the council where there weren't 
let's say a, a hundred people um, reading from the podium for or against an issue which makes that a very controversial issue. That's what happened prior to the riots. There was this dog and pony show in front of the Aurora Police Department when the the mayor and the chief and others were all saying everything's great, everything's fine, Aurora is is does not have a problem and, and to some degree look we are not uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin, we're not Joliet, Illinois, we're better than that we still have problems but the crowd was clearly agitated by that answer and, and that um, narrative and they had a different opinion. This is so, we get the PR coming out of the administration and then we get the reality, the things that I hear on the campaign trail, those voices of dissent within the crowd. What, what a, an engaged mayor should have done, what I would have done, is to stop the PR show and have a real discussion about where we need to go as a city um, and, and give the microphone physically to those people and start listening then. That probably would have diffused that entire day. And, and if it didn't, even going downtown that night with a bullhorn and trying to engage people and have a dialogue, um, at, at any point, that's going to be my approach is to, is to share the microphone with the residents because our job as a council and as mayor is to represent them. So th those are my thoughts on, on how we can uh, prevent that kind of rioting in the future. And then, of course, I, I feel strongly that some of the things we've already talked about with respect to police reforms, um, improving economic opportunities, improving after-school programs and youth services, that we can uh, start to address some of the root causes of the civil unrest. So it, it's not one silver bullet answer. There's many pieces to the puzzle. Um, you know, and, and again, part of that we talked about rebuilding trust between community and police. Uh, so th does that answer your question? And, and if you have other thoughts, I'd, I'd welcome them here. Yeah, well, it kind of it kind of ties into the uh, review board that they're trying to the civilian review board. You know, uh, I've been looking over the paperwork and looking at the duties and everything. I've also applied for that because I don't see it has a lot of teeth. I don't see the mm -hmm. civilian review board having power. Mm -hmm. It's more of okay, this is our suggestion, but the mayor and the and the Police chief are the ones that are going to make the decision, regardless of what we, or regardless of what the civilian board says. How would you change something about that? So about I, I have, I have. Um, so I mean, my, my hope, Casey, would be that after four years, we've we've over four years changed the relationship between community and police um, to have our shared vision, shared common goals addressed. That there's no need for a, a civilian review board. Um, I spoke out at the council meetings and the change initiatives saying that the civilian review board should be a civilian oversight board and it should have the power and a budget to hire its own independent investigator. So if there is an incident like George Floyd, if there is an incident of alleged police brutality, that an independent authority can investigate that situation. But my hope would be that we're, we're really able to repair things and we're all one city working together for the common good. That's my, my hope at the end of four years. Um, will I revisit this question with the council, new council? If elected, the answer is yes. Yes, I, I will. Um, and and I, think you, I think you had asked a question about transparency earlier too. I think that'll, that'll give a more transparent process. And here's one other thing that I've heard at the doors but I haven't verified or, or looked into. Apparently, in Aurora, you used to have access uh, and, and made public information um, where police happen in, in a neighborhood. So you could see what police incidents happen in your neighborhood and you can't see that anymore. And I think that's, um, it, it just goes back towards the, the question of transparency that you should be able to see what's happening in your neighborhood. If, if that's true, I, have, I haven't heard it. Sorry, go ahead. Let's say Helen has her hand up. So go ahead, Helen. Question coming in on Zoom. Um, my question was, um, the other men running for mayor are lawyers, and they both have experience in 
city government. So what is your education and experience that would put you on a par with them? Can I start with a lawyer joke? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't know that being a lawyer qualifies you for anything. Uh, you know, I'm a union carpenter. And I start with that, proud union carpenter, green builder, but I also have a college degree from Illinois State University. Um, I graduated uh, on a dean's list. I graduated top of my uh, class as an intelligence analyst in, my, in, in those schools in the, the U.S. Navy. And I have a little bit of postgraduate school. If people are looking at those pedigrees, I have strong leadership skills that have been demonstrated throughout my involvement in the community, that have been demonstrated throughout my work with uh, Northern Illinois Jobs of Justice. And what I think puts me above the other two is a commitment uh, to, l let me just say this, our politics are very different. And I believe in the politics of empowerment, I believe in the politics of bringing people together, I believe in embracing local solutions uh, to the problems that our community Basis that the community has the answers and and um, bringing people together and empowering people, not necessarily with handouts, but um, by by changing people's life stations by uh, giving creating more economic opportunities through education. So I think these are probably more defining differences between us. Um, I did serve on the East Aurora School Board, so I have some government experience, know how to run a meeting, and. Um, and, and I uh, just feel like I, I think that people see me for who I am and what I'm committed to to improving the lives of the working poor and committed to the long term goal of, of repairing our, our climate. Does that answer your question? We've got one coming in on Facebook. Facebook Q&A. Okay, so let me scroll back here a little bit. There was one up here. Uh, any uh, going further up on the list? Any thoughts on revamping the ethics ordinance or enforcing campaign contribution limits on candidates that goes above and beyond Illinois Board of Elections? And that's from Hector. Hector, yes. So um, I am against corruption broadly. I'm against a contractor. Donating ten thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollars to the uh, current mayor's campaign, any city council member's campaign, and then that same contractor getting a large co um, uh, contract through the city. I'm against that whole pay-to-play system and, and anything in corrupt in government. And let's start off. This this process of change starts in the campaign. It doesn't start when you take office. So I'm not taking any money from people that do business with City Hall, people that want to do business with City Hall. This campaign is powered by people knocking on doors, volunteering their time, and it's powered by small $25, $30, $50 donations. Uh, some people that can give more do give more. I think our top contributor is, is $1,000 at this point. I don't think we have anybody giving more than that. So. That's where reform begins, and then I think I started off this um, discussion tonight by talking about, you know, in the first 30, 60 days, we need to visit ethics first, and we need to rebuild trust with the community, and the best way to do that is to pass more stringent ethics reform that do have caps. Uh, now, I'm going to have to work with the whole council, so if that's a $1,000 cap, it's a $1,000 cap. So if you're a contractor, you do business with the city of Aurora, there's a $1,000 cap on, on what you can donate to any one uh, candidate, and that is m more stringent than what state law um, allows. I hope that answers your question, Hector. Thank you. All right, we've got a couple more on Facebook. Do you want to read them? Absolutely. Uh, how do you feel about adding a cadet program in all Aurora high schools and hiring more minorities that uh, live in? The Aurora community. And this is from Ron Neal. Ron Neal. I think that's an excellent idea. Um, I know that there's already a cadet program. I don't know uh, who, who's recruited for that program. Um, I do think that, you know, at, at, at East Aurora, we had a Grow Your Own program where we wanted East Aurora students graduating, going off to college, and coming back to East Aurora to teach. Uh, I think you want the same thing in your police force, and if you think about it, why not even in city council, right? So 
Uh, I think that's an excellent idea. I, I'm for it. I think that could be added to our um, sort of police reforms, what were the discussion. I think that's excellent. And, 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 and of course, if you're drawing from East Shore Schools, you're drawing from the, the population uh, that's here, and, and it should be representative of the, of the city. With respect to racial demographics. So Kathleen has a question. Um, the pandemic has shown how vital the internet is to students, their families, and all citizens in our city. Mayor Wisner years ago had a plan to bring free internet to Aurora, which never really materialized. Do you favor a free internet connection, which is part of the commons in the city of Aurora? If so, any ideas about how you would do that? Okay, so this is actually a question that's popped up a lot on the Nextdoor app and, and um, some other social media where people want uh, better access to broadband and affordable access to broadband because pretty much we're in a, uh, largely Aurora is a Comcast monopoly. And I myself recently moved to AT&T Fiber Optics. I saved about $20 a month and the connection is so much better. But I, it's not currently available. So number one is to, to try and entice more players here. But if not, um, I do want to look at having uh, public, I, I don't want to say free because nothing in life is free, but public access to high speed fiber optic network that's publicly owned and controlled as an alternative to uh, the Comcast monopoly. Now, you mentioned uh, the pandemic in schools. There is an enormous expense put out by a lot of the school districts to have Wi-Fi hotspots for kids that were not able, to, their families were not able to afford Comcast, but those kids still need to go to school. So there is, we looked at one city out in the Western United States, smaller city that did do this, and they did it through several options. The, the homeowner can pay like an upfront $3,000 charge, or they can pay $20 a month. And I think everybody listening now would agree that $20 a month is much cheaper than the 70, 80, some people's Comcast bills are at $200. So I, I would definitely want to look at it. Um, th there is a current um, upgrade initiative ongoing, and I don't know what those contracts are like. I firmly believe that, that that'll be a big mess should, uh, should this mayor get an, another um, bite at the apple, another four years. Okay, we have a few more um, minutes for some questions, about 10 more minutes, but we want to remind everyone that we will be doing more of these. The next one will be on January 8th. We'll be moving these to Fridays and um, have them every other Friday, and we'll be uh, um, inviting special guests as well. So if you have any last minute questions, please feel free to put it in the chat of any of the social media platforms or raise your hand in the Zoom, and we will get Kate to call on you there. Um, in the meanwhile, I've got a question here that, um, uh, Leah asks, what are some of your turning points in your life? Turn, turning points in my life. There's been a lot. I was not born in the United States. I was born in West Africa. Um, it was uh, leaving that country amidst a military coup. It was very uh, fused in my memory. And um, there was a, a whole, at age 12, there was this huge change in lifestyle, but also cultural change be between what was normal. At, uh, so, you know, moving any child at that adolescence late age is, is challenging, but doing it at, um, cross-culturally was even more challenging. Pivotal points, joining the military was a huge shift, getting out of the military, and, um, you know, being engaged politically actually is a very life-changing experience because I became uh, active and, and instead of just watching the world go by me, I was able to become part of it and start to influence change and seeing some of those tangible changes happen around me was is exciting and empowering. Gregory's asked this question a couple times and I'll, I'll read it off now. Uh, what's your position on rent and mortgage relief in Aurora in response to the ongoing economic crisis? So a lot of these rent and mortgage relief, um, I, th I think it's best to be honest when you're not 100% well versed. I know that I read um, 
parts of the CARES Act and stimulus bill to see how that money would be implemented and I know that there are lots of uh, relief programs and um, obviously I would support them but a lot of that is federally administered if, if there's you know if there's a change and it's more locally administered I think the the thing we would want to do is be equitable and fair and how we allocate those resources um, there was also money available to, to uh, help small businesses who were struggling through the pandemic. This is where I say, hey, shop local, shop Aurora. If you're going to go out to eat, make sure to sh uh, we have a number of excellent restaurants. <laughs> Give the, uh, the please dine at a local Aurora restaurant plug. That's one way you can support them. But uh, I haven't broken those numbers out yet. I want to do a little more digging into it to see which businesses got help. And the city didn't have a hand in, in, in handing out those dollars. Were they politically connected handouts? And were the businesses abiding by COVID restrictions, keeping their doors closed for restaurants? Um, so I, I think we need to look at that a little further. I know it just came out, and then our research team hasn't cracked that nut. Uh, but, you know, the, there's another challenge here, too, that I want to hit on, which is landlords are also struggling. Uh, so some, there's no real regulation and some people who might not have lost their job due to COVID, uh, and I've heard this from landlords, are uh, taking advantage of the moratorium on rent and the landlord is struggling, and these are some small mom and pop landlords that they, they might own a pr their own private home and a, and a second home. And, and I don't think that's right. Um, if, if you lost your job and are in a situation of hardship, you should be eligible and should take advantage of that COVID relief money. If you did not lose your job, you should not be using this opportunity to screw over your, land, your landlord. I'm not sure if I answered your question, Gregory, but um, the, you know, we definitely on the businesses are still breaking that out and I just want to be, be honest with you. All right, Nicole asks, do you have any plans or ideas on how to balance downtown development and gentrification? So I'm against gentrification. I think the current rebuilding of downtown looks to me very much like gentrification. And it that won't just affect residents and, and residential rental spaces. I think it'll affect businesses that have already poured their heart and soul into some of those buildings and, and then we'll see their rents go up. So the people that have worked really hard over the last decade to bring Aurora downtown back um, could be could suffer. Um, the, the way I would start with rebuilding downtown is the same way that I would want to approach neighborhood development because I think both are important. And there's been a heavy focus on downtown. There needs to be because it's what brings our city together and binds us together. And I think if you haven't been down on a first rise, you should definitely go. But the, the west side development is, is still at forefront, I'm sure, of my mind, the alderman at large, and the fifth ward alderman. But uh, the way to do it is make sure that we're including the voices of the businesses, the nonprofits, and the residents that live in that, that area, right? And so in the same way that we have a community meeting, to, in a goal setting meeting to, for the whole city, I think we need to have something similar to that so that the local people that have in, made investments down there's voices are being heard, that the people that were helping to um, survive and thrive downtown are, are, are local and committed to our city before we approach outsiders who might bring um, developer money in and, and then raise uh, rents on, on both residential and commercial spaces. Um, I want to make sure that we, what, what we have, the, the, the word that comes to mind as I think about downtown is uniquely Aurora. So I don't think we're looking to be the next Geneva or the next Naperville. We want to be Aurora, and that means we want to be diverse. D diverse in our artwork and culture and reflective of the community. Okay, Lynn asks, what do you think the most exciting or effective learning environment would be? The most exciting or effective learning environment. Okay, so I'm not running for school board. Um, <laughs> I think the, the most effective learning environment is a questioning environment. 
As an intelligence analyst, I, so I said I graduated top of my class, and one of the best instructors I had was always pushed a questioning attitude. Question everything, question everything, question everything. When I started, so I, I went to intelligence school before I went to Illinois State University. And when I applied that and, and developed a questioning attitude about everything, it made me arrive at better answers. As Just as a carpenter, if I stop and look at what I'm doing and say, what's the best way to do that? And I start asking questions, I arrive at better answers. Uh, so, and, and I think there's an application here for city government, right? If we step back and say, what's the best approach to this, this problem? Um, and, and, and present just that question before the council and before the community, I think you're going to arrive at different answers and, and probably the best answer. Um, we would like to, uh, we only have a few minutes left, so we'd like to uh, ask one more question here. Um, this was sent in beforehand. Where would you like to retire? Well, <laughs> where do I want to retire? Uh, I'm going to, so... Uh, I'm happy here in Aurora. I was born in West Africa. I moved around the world. By the time I bought this house here at 710 South 4th Street, I had lived in 24 different places, and I felt at home in Aurora. I literally, I, I wanted to put down roots. I was in my 30s. I literally planted a, a burrow tree in the front yard. It was a symbolic gesture that I was not leaving uh, the house here at 710 South 4th Street. So. I, I like the idea of retiring here. If um, I will vacation on the beach and I might build a tiny home, uh, take that periodically for vacations, but I love Aurora and I'm staying. Fantastic. So we will be doing more fireside chats on Fridays. The next one will be January 8th at 7 p.m. You can catch John on any one of his social media platforms. That's John for Aurora. And uh, please, if you didn't get a chance to have your question answered, John will be going through all of the social media platforms and answering them. Uh, but you're welcome to send in a question for next time. We do plan to have a special guest and we'll be announcing that as it gets closer. John, do you have any final words? Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks everybody for putting this together, for participating, for the great questions. Um, I believe that government belongs to everybody, which means I am subject to taking your questions throughout the campaign taking your advice as, as your next mayor. I look forward to serving in that capacity. I hope to earn your vote on, on April 6th. I believe that we have some very exciting things that we can do here and uh, make the city, city of Lights a beacon of hope. And I think America is looking for hope. Thank you.